six to seven so the door still will be open and i know we were able to gather together last time during the hurricane and praise the lord the lord kept it off of us Amen. but uh there's definitely a need to be praying about those people in the bahamas because that's just devastating all the way through so i want god to continue to have his way here tonight so i'm gonna give you an opportunity to give if i could here if i could have an usher come forth with my usher no usher come on up here son I know, you got double duty. Come on, buddy. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Give me an opportunity to give unto the Lord, and I just want the Lord to bless you. I've learned too many times that if you're in financial distress, the thing to do is go ahead and just give your way out of it, is what it is. The Bible says that there was a widow that came up, and she was given into the treasury. Sister Judy, the Bible says all she did was give two months, two maybes. Can you say Amen. Just two maybes is all it was. And that was less than a penny that she gave. But when she gave it, the Bible says she gave more than all those who gave before her. A lot of the others were saying, hey, look at what I have. Let me show you what I have right now. Just kind of wave it around and throw it in there. And thought, boy, we blessed God real big, so we must be able to get a real blessing. But I can tell you this. The Lord says that she gave more because she gave out of her usury. She gave out of all she had, and she did it because she loved God. Now, I do believe God wants us to be wise with our money and budget our money, do what we have to do. But I also know he don't want us to hold back what's rightfully his. There is a 10% that must be given if you want to go ahead and enter that covenant relationship. But then there's that above and beyond offering that God has given us the opportunity to give. And that above and beyond offering is what they call a love offering. Is what you love to be able to do and give out of a cheerful heart, not out of fear because you feel like, oh, God's going to condemn me, but because you want to. And I do know that God will bless you in that way. He always has and always will. He showed it to me time and time again. 
Has a pastor ever been in financial distress? You better believe I have. There's been times where I had to wonder, okay, how am I going to go ahead and pay this bill? And all I would say is, Lord, you know the need. And Brother David, what does he do? He fills the need. He says, I will supply your every need. And that's what he does. And he's done that in my life so many times. And I thank him for it. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Bauer, go ahead and stand up, preacher, and bless this offering, will you?
prayer about the heaven. Let 
in my mind Go back to that stormy night When getting time I saw the light And the light from that old lighthouse Fend up there on a hill And I Yeah. Mm -hmm.
right now in church. He is worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship the Lord, and what worship is, is lifting your hands to somebody who's worthy. That's what worship is. And I know I came into this race, I came into it with my hands in the air and full surrender, Brother Bowers, and say, God, you're mine and I'm yours. Full surrender. I need you right now. I came into the church, I came into the church with my hands in the air and pure worship. Just thank you, God. And I do believe as when it's all said and done, Sister Bowers, I want to make sure I go out with my hands in the air in pure worship. And just thank you, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's things in life will dictate your worship if you let it. There's fear, worry, anxiety, stress. The life itself just comes your way and the, the balls are thrown and you miss, you strike out. And sometimes I'll keep your hands low and your head low. But I promise you this, the Lord is still on the throne and he's still the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And whatever circumstance, whatever you're facing in your life, he's still God. Whether it's financial, straight, whether it's emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, I promise you, he is still the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I don't want to allow the, uh, the Satan to steal any worship from me. I don't want to allow religion to steal any worship from me. I don't want to allow myself to steal any worship from me. I want to give my worship to God. I want to make sure that he gets full worship. Full praise because of who he is. Amen and amen. Amen. What I would like to do is if you have a need in your life, I want your hand to go up in the air right now and say, God, I need you right now. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Need you, Lord. Oh, my Lord, I need you. Now, will you stand up with me right now, please? And say, God, <clears throat> you know what it is. I want you to pray with me, church, as if God is going to give you the answer tonight. I want you to pray with me as if you know that God hears your voice and you know that he has your best interest in mind. And then I want you to put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder, if you will. And I want you to pray for them as well. Will you do it? Dear Father, we so desperately love you. We praise you and we thank you once again, God, for bringing us here together. And my Lord, I'm asking you as we have gathered here together in your name that you would bless your people, that you would bless your church. And my Father, that you would give us strength, dear God, and endurance to continue to move forward in you. I know, my Lord, that you have the answer already prepared for us, my God. And as we hear, Lord, we're here and waiting for that answer. Give us patience and endurance, Lord, to wait, dear Father, in the name of Jesus. My Lord, I know that you have our life already planned out, God, and all we need to do is trust you. Put our hope and our confidence in you, my Lord, and I bind here with my brother, believing, dear God, that you're going to work it out, Father, as you always have. My brothers and sisters, Lord, they need you, God. I'm asking you to bless them, Father. My family, God, help them, Lord. Help this service tonight. And this message, Lord, let it be anointed of your word. And God, we will continue to give you all the praise and glory and honor. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. While you stand and grab your Bible and go to John chapter 8 with me, please. John chapter 8, starting in verse number 31. I feel the Spirit of God here with us right now. He's there, he, he's he's percolating something in the heart. And I do believe that this word, I believe, is for everybody that's here tonight. So I want God to bless you abundantly. In John chapter 8, starting in verse number 31. John 8, verse number 31. If you're there, say amen. 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 The Bible says, Then said Jesus to those Jews, which believed on him. That's very important there. If ye continue in my word. Everybody say continue. Amen. In my word. Then. Everybody say then. Amen. Are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall. What does it say? 
make. It does say set in another part here, but it says make in this particular verse. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed. We're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? I'm glad when Jesus gives them the answer. Look at this. And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. We prayed over the word. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm free. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. You may be seated if you want to. Amen. I believe in the next couple weeks we're going to be dealing with a, a, a series of freedom from worry and anxiety. Freedom from worry and anxiety. And it seems like in the ministry here, God has been preparing me for, for this particular message. But, but knowing that there are people who suffer from anxiety and from fear and from worry. But knowing that the Bible has the answer for that. Amen. Not everybody experiences worry in the same way. It's all right. Not everybody experiences stress in the same way. Some people just deal with it in different ways. Other people deal with it in this way, that way. Some people deal with it with running to the bottle, to the drugs, to the women. Some people deal with it by just, you know, imploding in a sense and kind of putting up walls and not really growing as God would have you to grow. But I can tell you right now that as we live here in this day and age, there is an answer to worry and to anxiety. And his name is Jesus Christ. Well, the Bible says he has come to make you free. Now, that's something we must understand. Now, in a legal sense, what the Lord has done, is, have done for us is literally free us from the Mosaic law. We're not under the law anymore, but we still fulfill the law by being obedient to the law. Because of the very grace of God, we are able to fulfill that law. The law doesn't make us holy. The law doesn't, you know, make us sanctified. But I can tell you this, the Spirit of God lives in you. You will abide by that holy law. God will help you to fulfill, to establish the law is the word I was looking for. You establish the very will of God. And that is truly what the Old Testament is. It is the will of God. You want to know how to act, how to live, how to breathe, what to do with your neighbor, what not to do with your neighbor. Open up the Bible and read the law of God. Amen. It will tell you how to live. It will show you how to live a holy life. The Bible does command his people to be holy. Be ye holy. Why? For I am holy. Now I can tell you this. The only way for an individual to be truly holy is first and foremost you must be born again. That's the bottom line. You must trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you must rely on the finished work that he has provided for us on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, cleanses us, washes us, and makes us whiter than snow. Now, I can tell you this. There's no more cleaner of a person to those who have been blood-bought and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You are holy and separated unto God. Now, listen here. I do know there are many people who just grab a hold of the outward appearance and, and, and take that as a sign of holiness. Now, I'm going to tell you that if you are born again, you are going to dress in a holy way. What is that? It is a Christ edifying way. You're not going to sit there as that old saying goes. If you're not giving, why be advertising? If you know what I'm saying. There is a way of dressing and it's dressing in a modest way that pleases God. But please, please, if you find yourself in that position just judging people on their appearance know this God doesn't he looks at the individual's heart and knows how they live on the inside and out many people outwardly put on a show do you hear me many people outwardly put on a mask many people out 
outwardly put on, hey, everything's fine. I'm doing what, what I can for God. But inwardly, the Bible says they're whited sepulchers, dead men moans. On the outside, they might look as holy as the Pope, but in the inside, they're a ravening wolf. They're a devil. If you will, living in sin and allowing sin to dictate their life. Now, I said all this to say this. All that to say this right here. It's the same thing dealing with worry and anxiety. I can tell you, you can look at somebody and look on the outside of appearance and say, yeah, they're doing okay. They got somewhat of a smile on their face. You know, everything is going their way. But inside, they're just, it's a sea, a storm, a storm of, of emotions are going back and forth. And you're just trying to find some stability in life. You're trying to set your compass and find what is truly real. And I can tell you this, church, what is real is life. And life is in Christ. Christ is life. That life that he has given us is our stability because of who he is. I'm going to tell you that if you ever have a question on what is truly love, open up John 3.16 and find out where it says, For God so loved you that he gave. Jesus said it this way, No greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I'm telling you, as the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took every nail, every beating, every spitting, every ridicule word that come his way was for you and to free you from sin, from worry, and from anxiety. He didn't do it for nothing. He did it for you. Amen. Amen. I want you to consider this now. That as the Lord has given us the wisdom to study His Word, to believe in His Word, you must also understand that there are outside forces trying to get you to question and doubt His Word. You also must understand that we are living in a spiritual world. We see the outside of it. We see the business aspect of it and say, yeah, well, I'm just looking at what it is. But like I said, dealing with life itself, you can see somebody who claims to be holy inside living in sin. Somebody who claims to be doing okay inside their hearts in turmoil. The same way with the world itself. You look on the outside, it's beautiful, lights, everything's wonderful. But if God was to go ahead and pull back the curtain, you would understand that we are living in a spiritual world world. There are spirits that dictate the higher powers of government. There are spirits that dictate the lower parts of government. There are spirits that even dictate me, if you understand what I'm saying. It's a Holy Spirit, can you say amen? But a spirit all the same. It still doesn't mean that other spirits don't try to come up and take the place of the Holy Spirit. It happens on a daily basis. I've dealt with it in my life numerous times. There's been a trial that I can share with you and I think I will a little later but right now I just want to set a foundation of how we deal with worry and with fear I do believe that as a Christian I, I can tell you as the Lord has said he's going to make you free I believe as a Christian we can have victory over worry and over fear and over anxiety and I'm talking about a daily life over worry and fear and anxiety of victory every day just living a victory victorious life in Jesus Christ. I believe that. The reason why I believe that is because the Bible says I can. If he can set me free from sin, which will lead me to death, I believe he can break the chains of fear as well. I believe he can go ahead and give me such tenacity to believe him beyond all human measure that he can throw me in a lion's den and I would say, lion, move over. I need to get some sleep right now. I got a big day in the morning. Can you say amen right now? Amen. To be able to put your head on the lion's mane and say, praise the Lord, I'm comfortable right now. Hallelujah. Enjoying this good night's sleep. Nobody's going to bother me for a day. Go ahead, devil, shut your mouth. I'm going to get some rest right now. I believe God can give us that courage in that way. So the point I want to make out to you, make, make to you is this. Jesus has made you free from sin. I want you to think about that. Jesus has made you free from sin, but also, it, with that being said, he also has made us free from worry and anxiety, if we'll allow him to. Now, I'm not saying you're going to go through your life and never be concerned or worry and anxious about anything ever again. I wish I could give you that antidote, but then we'd be in heaven. Can you say amen? 
but there will be times where worry and anxiety and fear will try to dictate your every day. And I can tell you this right now, that's not of God. The Bible says that he doesn't give you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I believe not. He says, fear not, for I am with thee. He said, perfect love casteth out fear. Why is he telling us that if it's not going to be an issue? I'm going to tell you this. We will face it. We will have to go through it. But I can tell you this, as the Bible says, praise be to the Lord. We are made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the very word of who we say he is. I don't know about you, but I believe he is the Son of God. And if he's the Son of God, he's my Lord. If he's my Lord, that means he is Lord over all things. And if he says he's the Son of God, he's my Lord, I don't have anything to worry about. Why so? Because he's with me. He's my God. He's my King. So, I want to bring this point that Jesus has made us free from worry and anxiety. Now, what is worry? What is worry? I went ahead and looked at Webster's Dictionary in the, Bi in the Bible. The, the dictionary says the worry is to think about problems or fears. To think about problems or fears. So there's an entertaining going on in the mind. To feel or show fear and concern because you think, everybody say you think, that something has happened or could happen. Does that sound familiar? Something has happened or could happen. But then as you go deeper into this definition, you're going to see that it has a dual meaning. It ought to worry also means to choke, to strangle, to harass by tearing, biting, or even snapping, especially at the throat. Now, I don't know about you when I read that. There's one thing that comes to mind is a lion. Now, I preached on this a little bit, knowing that to worry means to grab a hold of flesh, to grab a hold of, a, of prey. And as a lion does, he seeks it out, searches it out, and must eat. So he grabs a hold of it and worries it, goes back and forth with it in his mouth. But let me tell you this, that's just like Satan, what he does as he comes up to Christians. He goes around as a roaring lion. And if you allow him, he'll grab a hold of it. And the reason why I say allow him, because I do believe that God has given us victory over hell, death, and the grave. And what I'm saying is I'm, he's not going to come and purr up against you and bite you. And, and, and you don't have the power to knock him off. I can tell you this, that God has given you that power to go ahead and shut the lion's mouth. He has given you that power through the Holy Ghost and through his word. How do you know, Pastor? Because I felt like I've had a whole pride on me one day and then and another day. I felt like I hold to have the whole clan on me. Every line from here to clues it was biting my head. And all I could do was say, Lord, enough's enough I need for you to get this off of me. You leave the care and the word and anxiety right here and walk away and those lines fall right off. But to worry and to tear. And there's times, Brother Gene, before I didn't know what to do. The line would grab my throat and just go back and forth. But it really wasn't the throat, it was the mind it would grab a hold of. In the mind, it would grab and just tear back and forth like a like a like a washing machine, back and forth, agitated. When you think you'd get victory, then this would come and hit you this way. And just go back and forth as shaking or pulling with the teeth. But also notice this: to worry also means to touch or disturb something repeatedly. Repeatedly, when you think it's over with, what happens? It hits you again. When you think, okay, I'm, I'm all right, I got past it, but then all of a sudden, boom, it hits you again. I'll tell you, there's been a time in my life where worry was affecting me so bad. When I wasn't worried, I was worried about I wasn't worrying. Y'all look at me crazy. You're just as crazy as me, too. Come on, man. You almost ask yourself this question. Now, what was I worried about? 
Oh, oh, there he is. But the worry just gnashing and constantly disturbing. And this is what it is. As we sit here in life and remember, I told you there's outside forces that come in and it attack Christians. And as we are here, are to be a blossoming Christian, one that produces fruit in life. It's as if worry and the thoughts of Satan comes up. And here we are. But then he comes up and hits us with this right here. So we fall over. Hey, hey, that worked out good. Let me get this established back where it needs to be. So then he'll hit us from the other side. Then he'll hit us from the other side. And here we are back and forth, back and forth, front and back. Lay our head on the pillow at night and say, at least I'll be able to get some rest. Uh, uh, uh. That's when it'll even hit us the most. Hit us again. Back, back up. Two hours worth of sleep. Back and forth. Back and forth. You say, Pastor, what's going on right now? I'm telling you what's going on. That you might have a spirit of fear attacking you. You might very well have anxiety that is starting to come upon you. Worry is coming upon you. What I'm saying is there's a devil that is trying to stop you from fulfilling in the perfect will of God. And if he can get you worried about everything else besides keeping our minds focused on Christ, I'm telling you he's winning. But if we can just let him know where he stands in our relationship, oh, we can lift our hands and say, Lord, you're mine and I'm yours. This is too much for me right now. And you're going to find out that not only are we dealing with outside forces, but there's also inside. There's inside forces that we're dealing with that must be dealt with and put under the blood. So we know this, that there's a constant agitation. To worry also means to afflict with mental distress or agitation. To make anxious. Am I talking to anybody right now? To afflict with mental distress or agitation. To make anxious. Everybody say make anxious. To make anxious. To make you anxious. That's what worry does. What could possibly happen? What's going to happen? It could happen. It might not happen. But if it does... It's going to be bad, let me tell you. But it might not be too bad. But if that happens, that could be. You say, Pastor Corey, what is going on? I'm telling you what's going on. You're like in a washing machine. And you're sitting in the washing machine, and it's just on the agitation cycle. But hold on. The drainage and the spin cycle is coming up. <laughs> The Bible tells us to be anxious for nothing but with everything with prayer and supplication. You make a request, you may know them to God. But we're going to get to that point. So let me ask you this question here. You can answer yourself, but don't, you don't have to answer it out loud. Right here. What makes us worry? And I'm going to go ahead and pinpoint it for you right now. What makes you worry and what makes me worry? One word. It's the unknown. It's the unknown. Think about it. Why is your mind so agitated? How does Satan have a tendency to get an inroad and grab a hold of you? And get you start thinking about this, that, and other possible outcomes of the unknown. So you see, as the unknown, the what ifs of life, to keep you thinking about the worst outcome possible of whatever you're going through. To worry. The possible, the worst outcome. And I'll tell you what, what's interesting is when that comes our way, and it's happened to me numerous times, I'll, I'll receive some news, if you will. I'll receive a letter. And Brother Bauer, I'll receive a letter straight from Satan. You like right here. <laughs> I want you to have that. That's my notes. I can't give it to you. I want you to have that. Yeah, hold it for me. 
Go ahead. Yeah, that's all right. Do you want it? I wonder what it says. I wonder what it says. And Satan will go ahead and give you this letter and say, hey, this is yours right here. I want you to have this. You don't want this right here. It's yours. You don't have to take it. But you ever want to know what it says? But there's times where the letter is read to us. Yeah, we're going to have to do more tests. That's bad. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to make an appointment with you. And uh, yeah, this is going to be a while. The outcome, yeah, the statistically, this coming in, mm, it's not too good before it comes in. $22,000 you need to come up with in a month. <laughs> Only $22,000, Sister Judy, no problem. Only $22,000. You got a month to come up with it. Here it is. Or what you need to do is just not going to happen. Now what's interesting is when we receive that letter, this is what happens in the, in, in, in the mental aspect of it, the, the psychological aspect of it. This letter right here will consume our thought process. This one thought, this one news will grab a hold of us and start to consume everything that we are. And as this thought comes our way, we're starting to think about how to get past it. How to Get the $22,000. How to get to the test and hear the good news. Praise the Lord. You passed the test. All right. But let me tell you this right here. The thing that is causing you this agitation, the worry and the stress that comes that way is this. The outcome of the possible situation. The unknown of what it's going to be. How are you going to do it? What's going to happen? So you're living in the right now. You're trying to get two, three weeks down the road. Guess what? You're not a time traveler. Only pastors are. <laughs> Only pastors are time travelers. I told my brother of mine, I said, look, son, I want you to know this. I'm going to go to hell with you. Because he's going to hell. He's going through hell. I'm going to go to hell with you, but I can't stay. <laughs> Brother David, I'll go to hell with you, brother. But I can't stay. I'll go with you. But I can't stay with you in hell. Because the Bible says he has made me free. He has made me free. And in this news right here that I get, I must understand that if it's gotten to my hands, it must have went across his desk already. Because he's my Lord. And if this letter went across his desk already and he said approved for delivery, that means God must know I would have passed the test. He must know that whatever is said on this letter right here, I will pass this test. I will pass this test. Mm, it's your daughter. Sometimes these letters are signed perfectly for us. It has our name on it, stamped and everything. And it will come into our hand. The question is, what are you going to do? 
Are you going to look at this letter right here and allow the possible outcome of every situation to stick, take your life, take your sleep, take your hope from you, take your joy? Or are you going to remember that the Lord has made you free? Hey! Are you going to remember that God said, I have made you free? And you are free to show him. There's a story in the Bible, and what's awesome is both of these songs that were sung today were sung about this story. So pastors is having himself a good old time in the Lord because I know that God is honoring this message because it comes from him, but it's just confirmation that, hey, you're right on track with what you need to say to my people. I know this isn't a shouting kind of tear down and hang on the, the chandelier messages, but I think it's going to speak straight to your heart. So turn with me in your saint the Biblias to Mark chapter 4. And let Pastor go ahead and preach the Word of God to you. One of my favorite, favorite history lessons in the Bible. Mark chapter 4. Starting in verse number 35. The Bible says in the same day. Everybody say the same day. Same day. Anytime you get a letter, you need to say the same day to yourself right there. Because you need to live in the today. Because instantly... Worry takes you into the future. Possible outcomes. Unknowns. What could be. So as you receive the news, the letter, the feeling, whatever it is, you need to go ahead and stay in where it's at right now. He says, and the same day when the evening was come. Everybody say even. Isn't that the time that normally comes in the darkest time? When it comes when the sun going down, you know, and you're getting ready just to rest, and all of a sudden, here it is. Evening was come, he saith unto them. Now please write this verse down here. Write this down because this is going to be yours. Let us pass over unto the other side. Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they take him even as he was in the ship and there were also with him other little ships. Look at your neighbor right now and say, you're going through something, aren't you? Got your other little ship with you. What I'm saying is, even whatever you're facing, you're facing it not alone. You got ships with you. All right around you. You got those ships with you all the way around. Look what the Bible says. And there arose a great storm. Notice the storm wasn't there yet. It wasn't even there, but the commandment came, let us go over unto the other side. And the Bible says, and then there arose a great storm. Remember I told you there are outside influences that are affecting us on a daily basis. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Everybody say, now full. Now full. Notice the wind blew the water into the ship, and now the ship was sinking. It was now full. What are you saying, Pastor? It wasn't full yet. It wasn't full then, but it's full now. Just when you thought things were going good, all of a sudden your ship is full of worry and stress and anxiety. 
Just when you thought all was well, and when you look around, you're like, all I can see is this distress. All I can see is the problem. But let me go ahead and slow down a little bit for you. Because as you look to the bow of the ship, you're going to see somebody there that has always been there, that hasn't left. You're going to see somebody that's there in your vessel, in your boat with you. I want to go ahead and slow down a little bit and understand that as the Lord said, let us go over to the other side. The wind rose up. The problems entered into the ship. But I'm telling you this, church, the, the Lord and the Master is still there with you in the boat. And in the hinder part of the ship, okay, he's in the back now. <laughs> hinder. Part of the ship asleep on a pillow. Wait a minute. Here is Jesus asleep on a pillow. And look what they did. The Bible says that they awake him. And say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Look at the question. They're basically saying, Sister Ann, Jesus, don't you care that we're dying? Don't you care that we perish? Don't you care that right now the boat is so full, the vessel is so full, don't you care that we're getting ready to die right now? Aren't you concerned even in the least? Don't you care about what I'm going through right now? Look what it says. Notice he didn't answer them right then. Notice Jesus didn't say, oh, pat him on the shoulder and say, oh, yeah, everything's going to be okay. Notice he didn't do that, Brother Cain. But I'm going to tell you this right here. When you call upon Jesus in the midst of that storm, and you call upon him and you wake him up, and I'm going to tell you this right now, church, he does care what kind of trouble you're in. Oh, he cares grandly how much trouble you're in right now. He cares about how you're feeling, what you're going through. He cares about your emotional status, your mental status, your physical status. In fact, he knows everything about you right now at this very moment. He knows what your blood pressure is. He knows what your white blood cells are. He knows what your red blood cells are. He knows the very hair on your head are numbered, your toenail length. I need to clip my toenails. He knows it to the very millimeter. I'm telling you, Brother David, he knows everything about us at this particular moment in time. Every second that passes, he never loses inventory of his children. He knows where we're at. Knows what we're going through. He knows the very number. The Bible says he knows the number of hairs. I'm telling you, Pastor Cor is trying something new. I can't get the flat top right because it just lays back down. I'm telling you, there's something that keeps coming up in the back of my head. It's called a reflection. I'm trying to get rid of it. As I comb the hair back, Sister Ann, the reflection's still there. Don't understand what it is. But I can tell you this. God knows the very number of my head. And I'm not talking about he knows that there's 20,000 hairs on the top of my head. He knows this one right here. On a demonstration, I really got it. could possibly be 79,142. I really got one. Sister Judy, he knows the very number of this hair right here. Now look at what he does. He doesn't come up to him and say, oh, come on. You guys, oh, you guys, you're going to be okay. Sister, he doesn't come up and say, oh, you just come here, read Psalm 23 with me. We'll be all right. No, he doesn't do that at all, Sister Anne. 
I'm telling you, when they wake them up and say, don't you care that we're dying? Don't you care what we're going through? Don't you have a heart, Lord Jesus? Look at what he does here, church. Praise the Lord of glory. The Bible says this, and he arose. Everybody said he arose. He arose. Say it again, and he arose. Those three words right there are the gospel message preached to all of humanity in those three words. And he arose. And he arose. And he arose. And he arose. Those three words right there are this gospel preached unto you. The Bible says, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be Still, look what the sea did. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Can you lift your hands in the air right now? Please write those three words down and he arose and then write the other three words down. Peace be still. And he arose and peace be still. And he arose and peace be still. Now he answers them. You see, he don't give me any problem. He didn't comfort them first and say, Look, no, he just went up and said, Peace be still. Brother David, he didn't get up. What are you putting on? He says, these people can't handle this right now, Satan. He said, these people can't handle this right now. He stood up, and I just can imagine the wind and the rain and the boat sloshing back and forth. All the disciples are sitting in the boat, and all the power is looking right there in the eyes of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he's looking at the storm, and he says three words, peace, be still. I had that opportunity one day. I was out there farming. I might have told you this one other time. Maybe four. I'm sitting out there in the middle. That's when I was farming. Brother David, and we had to man the pumps. I don't know if I told you this before. We man the pumps. And we're over there. And you got to go out in some of the most hellacious storms when you're out there farming. Because you don't want those little tomatoes to drown. So you get out there and turn on the throw-out pumps. Well, I've got all my throw-out pumps early. I noticed the storm was coming my way. And this is when I just came back to God. My faith was so high. I'll tell you, I went up there. And you know these wonderful summer thunderstorms in Florida. Oh, boy. People get so freaked out with hurricanes. Let's go through a couple summer thunderstorms in Florida. You'll see what's going on. But these storms were coming my way. And I'm telling you, I stood up there. And I said, if Jesus can do it, I can do it. Peace be still. It started to rain harder. I said, maybe I didn't say it with the Pentecostal message. Peace be still. It started to rain harder. Or I had to get back in my boat, my truck, actually. And wouldn't you know, that rain came by so hard. And it had the truck swaying back and forth. It was a total wideout. You couldn't see the front of the truck. Rain, thunder, lightning. And I'm sitting here in the middle of this, uh, this truck going back and forth. But then after about 15, 20 minutes, praise the Lord, I started to see a little bit further. I started to see out the rain started to let up. And the storm was past. Then the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. He said, look, I know you didn't stop it, but didn't I keep you in the middle of it? I know I didn't stop it for you, but didn't 
I keep you in the middle of that storm? And all church, let me tell you right now, the master is on board of your vessel. And his name is Jesus Christ. He knows everything about your situation, everything about your family, everything about your progress and what to do. He's here with you. Oh, and I can tell you this, church, he's not asleep. He's on the right hand of the Father. Oh, I feel like preaching right now. He's not asleep. He's on the right hand of the Father making intercession for His church. He's making intercession for you. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is praying for me as I preach this gospel unto you. And He's praying for you as well. Can we lift up our hands right now and praise His holy name? I'll keep preaching, baby. Hold on. So why do we worry? Well, the baby Jesus is praying for us right now. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't go to sleep. Sister Anne, when we're sleeping, Jesus is praying for us and looking out for us right now. Oh, and I thank God for that. He always has his eyes upon his He's a good shepherd. He is a good shepherd. He's always looking out for his people. Now, why do we worry? I think we must understand why we worry. We first must understand who we are. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, 3. First Thessalonians 5, 23. And the Bible says, In the very God of peace, sanctify you holy. Everybody say, Sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Do you see that? Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. I pray that enters your spirit. Right now. Because there's nobody as faithful as Jesus. And if Jesus says he will do it, praise the Lord, he will do it. Jesus promised, if we believe, anything we ask of him, we will receive. All of his promises are true, and therefore me, and therefore you. What the Lord says he will do, then he will do. If Jesus said he will do it, then he'll do it. If Jesus said he will do it, say amen. If Jesus said he will do it, just hold on. If Jesus said he will do it, on him you can depend. Sister Noble used to sing this. If Jesus said he will do it, then he'll do it. If Jesus said he will do it, she said, then say amen. If Jesus said he will do it, just hold on, he'll see you through it. If Jesus said he will do it, on him you can depend. Can you lift your hands in the air right now and just like that? Oh, church, I want us to go home worshiping. Praise the Lord of your Lord. Oh, he will perform it, church. He will do it in the name of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. We're finding out who we are right now. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. Do you know how Moses makes his tea? You don't know how he does it? He brews his tea. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, for the word of God is quick. Everybody say, is quick. 
and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and of spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of thoughts and the tents of the heart. Please read verse number 11 with me. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You remember Jesus asked them when they were in the boat, why are you so fearful? Oh, ye of no faith. Why are ye so fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. Why? I believe God's going to help us know why there's times when the fear just overwhelms. And the worry hijacks our mind. And brings us into two, three weeks ahead. Now you understand here as the Bible has shared with us that, that you and I are in fact a triune person. We are made after the image of God and after his likeness. He said let us make man in our own image. So we know that there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Just as you and I are. We have a flesh. We have a soul and we have a spirit. The spirit man is dead until the Holy Spirit comes in and makes us alive. Now I want to break down the attributes of the flesh, the soul, and the spirit in these next, next coming weeks. And help us truly fortify this faith and hope that we have in God. And also be able to go ahead and kill the anxiety and worry that tries to just circumvent what God has said to you and I so many times. I'm going to ask you this church. Do you believe God? Now before you shake your head yes. Ask yourself this question. Do you believe God? Do you believe God? Look at your neighbor and ask them that question. Do you believe God? I know you do. Even when we believe God, it still doesn't change the fact there's times that old devil hijacks your mind and starts to take it elsewhere. But I want to be able to give you the tools to get it back. I want to give you the word to be able to get it back and once again be able to live in victory and say, you know what? Though he slay me, yet I'll still serve him. You know, he's able to deliver me from this flames, but if he don't know this, O king, we will not bow down and worship you. Now, dealing with the flesh man, the carnal man. Now, the carnal man is the man that we see on the outside, but also... The carnal man has appetites. Those appetites can be destructive at times because if they're not put under the blood and crucified, they'll become destructive to the individual. There's carnal appetites of hate. You know, the works of the flesh are, are, are hate, wrath, lust, and it goes so on and so forth. But I want you to know also that the body has five senses. And as you are living in this world here, that is how you deal with the, the outside world is with your body. But you know that we're not truly body. We're not flesh and blood. We're spirit. The Bible says that when we worship God, we worship him in spirit and in truth. Brother Gene, there's many people that worship God in the flesh. You know it as well as I do. They come in and get a religious duty, a religious piety. They'll come in every Sunday, sit down, lift their hands, worship God in the flesh, go out and never changed. They're just going with the religious motions of life. But I'm telling you, this, this book is spiritual. Christ is spiritual. We are spiritual. We're not a body with a spirit. We are a spirit with a body. Now, what are the senses of the body? We have the feeling. The eye, the ear, we hear, we smell, and we taste. Five senses of the body. 
Through those five senses is how we, 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 we feel out with this world, is how the world comes into us, whether by sight, whether by hearing, whether by taste, whether by feeling, whether by smell. So we know that this is how we navigate through this, this, uh, this life. Have you ever heard of Helen Keller? You have heard of Helen Keller. Helen Keller could not see, nor could she hear. But I'll tell you, she was a remarkable woman. She was able to navigate through this life through what God has given her. God has given her feeling, still had reason of mind. She was able to dictate what she was doing through life just by feeling braille and no other people, by touching them or even smelling them as they came up. She used her senses as God has given her to her best ability. And church, as I look around here right now, I know not everybody can hear like they used to. Not everybody can see like they're used to. Not everybody can even feel like they're used to. But I promise you this, if you still have part of those senses, you're still in a spiritual battle. But you also have victory in that spiritual battle. So, I want to go ahead and see... How we're not going to be able to get through all of them here tonight, but I want to go through two of them for us right now. I want to deal with the, 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 the soul of the individual. Now, the soul deals with this. You have the imagination. You know what the biggest nation in the world is? Your imagination. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, it's huge. It will run away with you if you're not careful. You imagine that, brother. Oh, that old blasphemic song with John Lennon and those Beatles. He's a Beatle. I'll tell you, he sang this song I can only imagine. And you think about that, what it was. He was imagining a world of one, everybody. But if you listen to it, it's very demonic. It's a very demonic song. He took God all the way out. Imagine a place where there's no religion. What it was, it was a setting up for the Antichrist. I'm not going there right now. Let me finish up here. Go ahead, verse it says right here, the soul deals with the imagination, the conscience, memory, reason, and affections. Now the spirit man and woman, we also have, well, there's a sense of a spirit man and world, woman that comes alive after the Holy Ghost comes in us. And check this out. You have faith, hope, reverence, prayer, and worship. You hear me? Faith, hope, reverence, prayer, and worship. Now, through the eye gate, this is what happens. Through the eye gate, it enters in the, through sight, which is how we deal with this world here. Enters in through sight, and then it hits the imagination. There's an imagination aspect of it. That's why you have so many people trying to sell you everything. You know, you have the, 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 the outside of it. And you've got the, the Bible says this, that the very uh, lust and desire for money is the root of all evil. You have everybody trying to sell you something and they put it in your face. Oh, just imagine what it'd be like you're driving in this lesson. Imagine you what it'd be like if you look like this airbrush supermodel. Oh, imagine how life would be. Imagine what life would be if you had this tri motor boat going into the Gulf of Mexico fishing for grouper on Sunday. Oh, it would be wonderful. But what I'm telling you is they allow all of this just consuming advertisement that enters in through your eyes. And then they start imagining, hey, do I need a new thing? What would it be like to have that new car smell? What's even sad, Brother Gene, you know as well as I do, you got the husbands there sitting, and all of a sudden they've got this woman that runs across trying to sell you some toothpaste on a beach in a bikini. And you think to yourself, hmm, what would it be like to use close-up toothpaste? But that's not what it is, sister. It's going beyond that. They're saying, look over at your wife right now. Does your wife look like her running down the way the beach right now? No, I'm glad she doesn't either. Because I know my wife, she might not look like that. She actually looks a lot better. Can you say amen? Real good. She looks a lot better. Not only does she look a lot better, she'll also help keep me up. She'll also pray for me. She'll also take care of my little rug rat children. 
She'll get up in the middle of the morning and go ahead and help me and make me breakfast. She'll take good care of me. That woman over there, she's worried about breaking a nail, getting sand between her toes, selling toothpaste. My wife would be right there fighting off an enemy if it comes my way in the name of Jesus. That's what she'll do. So the eye gate hits the imagination. Y'all pray for me. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> The eye gate hits the imagination. The imagination goes into faith. Faith, faith. Now faith and hearing are close to, but right now faith is going to be dealing with the eye gate. Because what happens? Normally we see something. We read something. It comes our way. Then all of a sudden the imagination starts going. But we must allow it to enter the spirit where faith resides. Where faith resides, check this out, came alive by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is connected to the spirit, the soul, and the flesh of man. But when the spirit is alive in here, faith is also alive. So what happens, it either comes in right here, through the eye gate, hits the imagination, Hits faith or comes in through the eye gate. And this is where the worry will take place. Right here. In the imagination. Remember what I said. That the imagination. And, and, and dealing with what, what causes the worry and all the anxiety. Is the unknown. The fear of possibility. The worst outcome possible. This is going, oh Lord, you can't get to them over here. This is happening over there. The devil's just throwing all manner of crazy visions and possible outcomes. Am I talking to anybody? Has this ever happened? And I'm telling you, as it comes in through the eye gate, then faith comes in. Now, what I'm saying is when faith hits the imagination, this is the way it needs to go. When faith hits the imagination, we must understand that this very word of God and who Christ is, we must cast down all imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So what are you saying? If you have a thought that comes your way, if you have the devil shoot you an arrow, if you get some bad news, if something comes your way and it grabs a hold of the imagination and starts going crazy, you must understand that it must never go above the promises of Jesus Christ. It must never go above the promises of the Bible. That's where faith steps in. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1, now faith. Everybody say now faith. That's very important. Please write that down. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. Now faith. Because what you're doing is bringing the situation back in the today. You're bringing it back in the right now. Because now faith. It isn't yesterday's faith. It's not tomorrow's faith. It's right now. Look at your neighbor and say right now faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence, everybody say the evidence, of things not seen. Through the Holy Ghost and your spirit and leading, yielding to the Holy Ghost, you're in fact allowing faith to dictate the situation and not the situation to dictate the faith. You see, he's come to make you free. He's come to make you free. To make us free. Praise the Lord. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. What are you saying pastor? I can tell you this. I wasn't there when the Lord said let there be light. But I look outside and I know that there's light. What are you saying? Faith rises up against all doubt and circumstance. People go ahead and invest their whole life in a big bang, in evolution. Not me. I invest my whole life in what thus saith the Lord. If the Lord said it, that's the way it went down. I believe it. Absolutely. Now what about future things? The Lord said that by every stripe you 
are healed. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm telling you right now by the very living word of God, he has healed your body. Claim it in the name of Jesus Christ. You cast down all imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the very knowledge of Christ. Go ahead and claim your victory right now. The Lord's touched me. The Lord's helped me. He's going to take care of the situation. The word has said it to be true. I'm holding on to it. You're not allowing the situation, the sickness, the trial to dictate your life. You're allowing Christ to stand up, not to come and call on you, but say, peace be still in the name of Jesus Christ. Did it fit together right? You see it. Faith meets the trial and the imagination. Worry is produced right then and there. You can coddle it, love it, allow it to just take place and hold, or you can let Jesus deal with it. And even tell yourself, I know the Lord has me. He's going to help me through it. Praise the Lord. He's going to help me through it. But you've got to pull it back in the right now. Now faith. Pull it back in the right now. Don't go two, three weeks in ahead of it. You pull it back in the right now. Where are you at? You know what? I'm still okay. I got the news. I don't know what's going to happen down the way, but I do know this. A couple years ago, I had a doozy. Praise the Lord of glory. He brought me through it back then. Right now, I'm going through it. But guess what? I know in the future, if he's the same that he was a couple days ago, he's the same right now. He's going to be the same a couple weeks from now. So what are you saying? You're bringing the faith into the very today and understanding that now faith is the substance of things hoped for. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't see it, but my faith is going to rise up against my circumstance. My faith is going to rise up against the doubt, the worry, the fear, and it's all going to be Christ taking care of it. Pull it back into today, right now, church. See how pastors are time travelers? I'll go with you a couple weeks in the future. I'll go with you to hell, Brother Dave, but I can't stay. <laughs> Let me pull you back in the right now. Lift your hands up and say that I'm a child of God. Who are I don't know. Live in the today, right now, church. Live in the, the today. Live in the today, church. Oh, God has you. Praise the Lord of glory. And you're able to fight the battles today. Today, you can fight them. Don't worry about the tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have enough worries of itself. But today, we can play songs, sir. Now, as we got through the eye gate, which is sight into the imagination and faith, let me go ahead and deal with the nose gate real quick as Brother David grabs, grabs a good tune here. Now, the nose gate deals with smell, of course, and conscience. Have you ever noticed how you could smell something and it brings you right back to when the first time you smelled it? I'm in love for it, for example. I noticed, Sister Judy, that there's smells I, I, I smell around and, and it reminds me of my grandma's house in Indiana. You know, she's been long gone for 10, 15 years now, but as soon as I smell a certain something, I don't know what it is, but it brings me right back to Indiana 30 years ago. Instantly. And that's the power of smell. It deals with conscience. It lets you know that you're alive. You have a consciousness of being alive, but also a consciousness of knowing that he's alive. Now, you got a conscience, which I believe was given to us from the fall, of really dictating what is right and wrong, letting us know what is right and wrong. But there's also a consciousness of knowing that, praise the Lord, I am here. I am alive. I might have been there before, but right now, I'm right here, right now. And my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is still with me. He's a right now, all time kind of God. Never changes. But... I can just, some of the, 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 the smells of food. Oh, I love smelling Thanksgiving dinner. 
There's nothing like it. Can, I'm not much of a football fan, but I can tell you I don't mind watching the parade, maybe a game going by, but there's nothing like uh, playing basketball at the end of the Thanksgiving dinner. Me and my boys and my nephew and my brother, we get out there and we play basketball. Do you know how hard it is to play basketball when you feel like a stuffed turkey? I'm telling you right now, you're out there trying to bounce the ball, just get rolled up there in the chest and just all oh, just going around. But I'm telling you, we're having a good time. But there's nothing like the smell of that Thanksgiving dinner. Just everything together. And it comes in through the store. And it lets you know I'm still alive. Praise the Lord. You have a consciousness about you. You know that you're caught, you're saved, you're kept in Him. The Lord will keep you. In this day and in this time right now. But look at what the spirit man or woman must do. When you understand the consciousness of life. Look at this. There also hope comes in. Hope, hope. Everybody say hope. I want you to read Psalm 42. I'm only going to read a few verses of it. But I want you to read Psalm 42. That's going to be another scripture that you're going to have to go to. To conquer this worry and anxiety. So we know that the, the eye gate, or yeah, the, smell, the nose gate deals with smell, deals with conscience. You know, whether a conscience of where we're at, but also a consciousness of being alive. But understand this, as we deal with hope, the spirit man or spirit woman knows this to be true. Just as the Lord has delivered us that Thanksgiving dinner last year, praise the Lord, I do believe in 2019 I'm going to enjoy another one. I have hope in that. I have hope that God has my best interest in my he knows everything about me. He knows everything about my family. So hope's going to come alive. And praise be to the Lord. I can tell you this to be true. I love pecan pie. But if I never eat a piece of pecan pie again. And the Lord takes me home. I still know I'm going to be with Him. I'll be with Him for all of eternity. But in the meantime. I'm looking forward to partaking of that pecan pie. I'm hoping. Psalm 42, as the heart panted after the water broke, so panted my soul after thee, O God. If worry has stole your pant, give your pant back to Jesus. Give your pant back to Jesus. Stand up with me, please. So panted my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsted for God. For the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Right now. Y'all come here at this altar with me. Come on down here church. Let's all gather around right here at this altar. I want you all to grab hands in the name of Jesus. 